So welcome, Nathan. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. I'm doing I've well. Been I've watching, been the watching the Stillathon in the background all afternoon and really enjoying the different interviews. I thought I thought that uh, it was great to hear from Dan Kitchen especially and get uh, one of the original programmers' perspective on uh, coming back to the homebrew scene. That was fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, it is really interesting. Somebody who programmed, legitimately programmed, while the Atari 2600 was out for Activision and now coming back into the scene and, and seeing how it is now and programming new games. So he's in a very, very unique position. I think I asked him once if he knows anybody else that has ever done that. That some, somebody who had programmed back in the day um, during the reign of the 2600 and has come back again and, and has made an all new homebrew. And he mentioned somebody who finished off a game that they started back then, but not somebody who's ever come back. So I think he might be the first one unless anybody can fact check me in the chat or if you know anyone. The only one I'm aware of is Rob Fulop. Uh, he came back and finished off Action Knots. Uh, with the help of John Payson and a, a few other people and put out a limited release of that. But um, other than that, I think the closest would be D. Scott Williamson, who did his own version of Star Castle. But he was more of a Lynx programmer than a, a 2600 programmer. programmer. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so finishing off a game that you started back when it was out, I, I don't count that. So... <laughs> so. Well, uh, probably Dan is the first one to um, to do that, but there might be maybe yeah, other this ones. Was like this the whole time, um, so thank you so much for your amazing donation of the Retron oh, 77 it's package. It's unbelievable. It's doing really well. It's the top one um, in all the auctions. Yeah, I'm really surprised. I'm I'm really pleased about that. I wasn't expecting it to go that high because it certainly didn't cost me that much money. <laughs> No, and, and I, I'm surprised too. Like it's a it's a retail thing, but there's so many bonuses with it that um, I think people see a lot of value in that. And of course, the all the games you've you did all the footwork for collecting all the homebrew games um, that are included on it and getting permission from all the developers. And I want to thank you so. Much. Yeah, that was really important to me to make sure that this was done legitimately. A lot of a lot of the ROMs are already available online, and you can find them in the forums, and and they've been freely shared. But I really kind of wanted the the homebrewers' stamp of approval with this because they all use Stella, they all support it, and I felt it it was really important to do that. And then also Albert providing all of the printed manuals to go along with it as well. I think that really makes it a nice item for people who are into homebrews and, and want that little extra piece with it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, very, very good um, package. Sorry, Tanya was, Tanya was talking to me. Um, <laughs> no. Oh, what, what did you say? No, I was just asking which screen was actually showing was broadcasting. Oh, it's this one, but now that you're not playing, it's fine. Okay. Um, so... You are the person who does a lot of the graphics and the box art design. And um, I wanted to see what kind of connections you have with Stella. And probably it's in, it's in, the, in the graphics that you do for the games and um, testing them out. And you did, did you do the Aardvark graphic, the big Aardvark? Yeah, I did all of the graphics in Aardvark. And uh, I also did the box art, uh, which I've sent to you to preview today, too. And um, I did that, actually, uh, when I was on summer vacation on an iPad using a really simple application. Usually I use Photoshop, but I was away from my computer and, and found this little Commodore 64 sprite creation tool and just started poking around with it. And um, I just had a lot of fun with it. It really kind of forced me to rethink um, how I was doing graphics. And I didn't, you know, I didn't have any of my Photoshop tools or anything, and I just was poking around with this one pixel at a time. Um, as far as, as how I use Stella, I use it all the time. Uh, I started using it almost 20 years ago, and just just to play games, mostly. And then when I started developing graphics, I'd send off the graphics to whatever programmer I was working with at the time, and they'd send me back a build. 
and in order to make sure the graphics worked, I had to check it on something. And I didn't have uh, a flash cartridge at the time, so there was no way that I could see if the animation actually worked in context or not. And so Stella allows me to you know, quickly play a build that a programmer sends me, and I can step through something if it looks wrong and take screenshots of it, take those screenshots back into Photoshop and figure out what went wrong and then fix them. And I use it all, I use Stella all the time for that. I use it for tons of play testing. Um, I tend to get, you know, these binaries that, you know, from the programmers when I'm working on these games and they're always looking for feedback. And that's really critical for um, a game uh, to really be developed to its fullest. I think that's one of the things that's so great about your show is that you're providing that feedback that that programmers are so hungry for. Thomas mentioned it uh, earlier today when he was being interviewed, how he wishes he'd have more YouTube videos of people just playing his games. And so I've I've tested a lot of of these games that I've worked on. It's close to 50 now in one capacity or another. And um, Stell is critical for that. Yeah, and, and I also see a lot of developers um, saying in the Atari Age forums, I, I don't have a Harmony cart. Um, can somebody please test this out? It works fine in Stella. So there's a lot of developers that rely on Stella for their um, for making making their games because they don't they may not have um, all the hardware or the the money for the hardware to test it on actual equipment. So it's uh, it's it's been quite a good boon uh, for developing games on the 26th. Yeah, and they've done an amazing job making it even more accurate. I, I think Stella 5 was probably the one of the bigger jumps. I think that's when they changed uh, most of the core uh, to be more cycle accurate. And then I think, I don't remember if it was Stella 6 when they started changing the audio. And, and with every major iteration, it just keeps getting closer and closer to the hardware. And that gives the programmers more insight into um, if their game's going to work or not. Uh, for example, when uh, John was playing around with uh, doing some bus stuffing games, we had a special build of Stella that worked with bus stuffing, but we couldn't always get it to work on real hardware. Well, now those now those same ROMs no longer work in Stella because Stella is now more accurate to the original hardware. Wow, that that is that's incredible, <laughs> um, and it and it does and Stella seems to go hand in hand with the development of of games that are pushing the limits of what has been made before, and and luckily the, it's such an active community that um, Stella can be updated like you were saying with the bus stuffing as as things progress um so that that's really interesting and it, it is the the audio that i think that was uh, cycle exact now uh, with the, the release of 6.0 yeah um, so it's amazing yeah. I, I guess that goes along with the the power of com the compute computation computational power that stella is running on now that uh, you can get closer and closer to the actual emulating the perfect um emulating it yeah i i've been dabbling in emulation of one form or other since probably 96 or 7 with mame uh with some of the earliest builds on the mac version and i remember even back then the computer that i had there there were only a handful of games that really ran well under stimulate uh, under emulation and then they'd start choking and at you know at some point you know i had to get a new computer to run some of those games and there's even there was even times when with stella advancing where you'd read complaints from people who had a really old pc and stella would no longer run full speed on it it's like well you know come on you know get rid of your windows 3 3 machine and get something newer um but it's it's kind of astonishing to me how much processing power it takes to properly emulate something that was so simple back in 1977. Oh yeah, it's it takes a whole lot of processing power because you're you're essentially translating things on the fly um, that were done in hardware. You're emulating hardware 
in software, which is unbelievable. And but it, it does it takes a lot of processing power just to emulate just like this old stuff. They haven't even like they're still trying to get PlayStation stuff, I think. PlayStation one going perfectly on modern hardware. So it takes a lot of horsepower to do it. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think that was my introduction. It was in the mid nineties, um, with, uh, NES emulation and Atari emulation. Um, I thought it was fascinating that I could play an Atari game on my computer and I didn't need the actual hardware to do it. And I think that was, um, before I got another Atari. I can't remember if I had the Atari first or if I played on an emulator first. I can't remember. Yeah, I, I yeah, had my Atari first, certainly. I bought mine back in 81, and it's still the same one I use now. <laughs> yeah, and that's a testament to the how long it uh, it can stick around for. It's unbelievable. Yeah, well, it, it's had some work it's done to work. it. I've had to replace capacitors, and I've had to replace a couple of chips in it, and I've put in an S-Video mod, and, you know, there's there's probably not a whole lot of original components left in it now, but... <laughs> um, so I know you do a lot of graphics, um, and I think you have done some of uh, your own games as well, if I remember. Mm, no, no, I haven't. I haven't created any any games. I'm not a programmer at all. Uh, the closest I've come to creating something was I came up with the uh, the idea for Stay Frosty, and subsequently Stay Frosty Two. Um, Daryl, you know, gets the full credit for taking that project on and, and, uh, programming it and, and Mike Haas and others, uh, contributed to stay frosty too, as well. Um, but it's kind of, it, it's, it's something I don't take for granted because that's a very rare thing. There's a, a lot of people, uh, who post, Hey, would somebody make this game for me in the Atari age forums? And that never happens because Every, every programmer has their own laundry list of games that they want to make that's, you know, stretching into the next 20 years. And so for Daryl to pick that up, and, and I think part of it, he can correct me on this, um, I think part of it was his nephew was uh, was over visiting and they were talking about what sort of uh, holiday-themed game we were going to make that year for the Atari Age cart. And I think his nephew mentioned, oh, you should make something with a snowman in it. And that happened to coincide with... Uh, me posting that idea in the development forum. So it was uh, serendipity, really. Yeah. So so is your background in art, or is it just something that you enjoy making, or do you do it as um, a hobby or as um, um, as your job? Or, you know, a it's just, uh, just an interest in 8-bit uh, uh, game. It's a little bit of all of the above. I've been drawing since I was a little kid. And... Um, but it wasn't until about my second year into college that I discovered that you could actually make a living as an artist. And so then I switched majors and eventually got a degree in advertising art, which kind of encompasses everything from illustration to graphic design to typography. And uh, I worked as a professional graphic designer for a while and wasn't really satisfied with that. And so I went back to college and got a degree in character animation at Cal Arts, and um, I never actually went into the animation industry. I ended up staying at Cal Arts, and I taught for a while. And uh, since then, I've, I've managed the computer labs for the character animation program there, and I've been doing that for 25 years now. Okay. Um, so, does anybody have questions in the chat for Nathan Strum? Um, is anything else that you wanted to bring up or talk about? Well, it's just the whole homebrew experience for me has been really kind of incredible because, again, I'm not a programmer at all. And um, when uh, programmers, you know, start reaching out for help on the forums for sound or for graphics or whatever it is, um, they're very welcoming to anybody who wants to contribute. And... Um, I've always I've never felt like an outsider really, even though I don't always feel like I'm contributing very much to the end result because, you know, I don't do any of the programming. That's, in my opinion, all of the hard work. And so, you know, I'll spend you know, a few days maybe working on the graphics or something, 
And then the programmer will spend the next nine months, you know, churning through the code, trying to make everything work. Um, but I, I've never had a bad experience working on any homebrew with any programmer. They've all been fantastic. Um, I've met very few of them. I've met uh, Zach Matley in person and Bob Montgomery and Glenn Saunders I met. He's the one who was the filmmaker behind Stella at 20. And I've met Albert, and that's about it. But um, but I feel like I know a lot of these people very well because I've worked with them a lot. And the the thing that's really surprised me most is the is how international this whole thing is. Um, because I've worked with programmers in Italy and in Brazil and Germany and the UK and all over the United States. And Aardvark was made by Thomas, who's in Germany, and Oscar, who's in Mexico. And I'm in California, um, and I worked on some of the graphic design for Boulder Dash. I didn't create the label artwork, but I laid out the manual. And you know, Andrew's in Tasmania, and Thomas is in Germany. I think you can't get three more distant points on the globe. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing um, community, and and amazing how um, people can come together to make something um, really, really great and using all of their individual talents. Um, so do they usually come to you for the artwork or do you see a project and go, oh, that would be a, a good project to lend my talents to? Um, or how, how does it usually start? Well, it, the way it started originally was um, I kind of stumbled across Atari Age while looking for ROMs for Stella. So that's kind of appropriate to this whole conversation. And um, I was uh, I found out about homebrews, and I was thinking, wait, somebody's making new games for this system, and this was probably around two thousand one or two, but there there was no YouTube, and there really wasn't much information about them. So the only way to find out about them was to hang out in the Atari Age developers forum. And so I saw that uh, I think it was Aaron Curtis who did Fall Down. Uh, was asking for help with the Running Man sprite in his game. And having the background that I did, I thought, oh, well, I can help with the animation on that a little bit. And so I did that, and he used it in the game. And so that was kind of the first time, you know, I'd gotten any credit or had any involvement with that. And then I did the same thing for Bob Montgomery's um, Go Fish. And then Bob asked me to work on Reindeer Rescue. And then... Um, I was asked to work on Colony 7 uh, by Manuel. I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name because I'll mangle it, but he goes by Cybergoth. And um, and I think that led to John asking me to work on Ladybug. And then, you know, so as as I worked on more games, other programmers, because they're all a very tight-knit community, they say, oh, I kind of like what you did there, and, you know, would you be interested in working on this? And so it just it leads from game to game to game. And if you're... You know, if you're willing to to work with them and um, just kind of help, you know, because that's what they're really seeking is they're, you know, they don't want somebody to come in and take over the project. They want somebody to, you know, fill in the gaps. And, uh, you know, then I think there's no end of work, really. Um, and as far as the, uh, like the box art and that sort of thing, that all started because um, I started entering label contests on Atari Age. Atari Age. Uh and and I, I entered a couple. I entered one for Climber 5 and one for Backfire and promptly lost both. But then um, the Crocodile cartridge, which was, I think, Armand Vogel's flash cartridge, um, I won that one. And that was a really high-profile contest because all the programmers were going to get a Crocodile cart. And so I won that contest, and then because I'd entered the other ones, I, I caught the eye of a couple people who asked me, and then Albert started asking me to do labels, and because it's hard to find people who are willing to commit that kind of time for no money. You know, um, it's, it's all a labor of love. And so, yeah, it is. so I just keep getting asked by people, and sometimes it's people I've worked with before, and sometimes... Somebody will just see something else that I've liked, and they said, "Hey, can you do something like that for my game?" and and um, I'm I'm happy to oblige. 
Yeah, obviously your, your artwork is unbelievable and uh, it's in-game and on the uh, box art as well. I mean, it really, I mean, the programming takes a lot of time, but these little, these enhancements of this, the sound, like the sound that I is supposed to does or the artwork that you do really brings the games to life. Um, did, did you work on chaotic grill a little bit are you doing work on that no that's no, uh that's entirely um splendid nuts work i think i don't know if he's working with a graphic designer on that or not um i wish i could remember his actual name uh this this is this is why i do not use an online handle because when i introduced myself i you know prefer to introduce myself <laughs> by my actual name, my actual name. yeah uh, it gets confusing uh, yeah <laughs> No, I have. I didn't work on that. Um, the next games that I've got coming out that I worked on uh, will be Wizard of War Arcade with John, uh, Galaga, um, um, Ardvark, of course, uh, with Thomas and Oscar. Um, those are, I think, the next ones that are slated for release. And then um, I just sent John about fifty sprites last night for a game he hasn't announced yet. So Ooh. we're we're kind Ooh. of you have inside Ooh. information. We're we're kind we're kind of sprites. excited. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's so a can, lot of sprites like, for hockey. I don't know if that's uh hockey. Well I I, I I can say it's not hockey. Okay. Oh. Can't say it's not hockey. It's okay. not it's well, not hockey. Well, we'll so, um but uh but hockey's definitely something John and I are discussing. You know, because nobody wants will to work on that. For, that. <laughs> for hockey? <laughs> Darcy duck yeah. Um, as many as he'll give me space for. <laughs> yeah, I guess that is a, a consideration that uh, they must give you um, limitations of, you know, lines and size of the sprite and how many that you can make because how much room they have left over. Is that something that they pass on to you that you have to take into consideration? Yeah, that's that's about the first thing that I ask for. Um, because I can't really make much of a start on it unless I have an idea of, of what the target is. So for, uh, for Mappy, for example, uh, John had to let me know what the heights of the characters were and that, yeah, I could do, you know, color changes per line with them and um, that they were going to be a single line resolution. And then I had to find out, okay, well, how much animation is in this game? And fortunately, somebody had done a sprite rip sheet for the arcade game. And so I could just basically do a one-to-one -one translation from that. But other games like Wizard of War, there is none. So I had to go and play Wizard of War arcade on MAME, record it, and then do my own sprite rips. And more often than not, I end up having to do that sort of thing. And then it's, you know, how many frames can you give me for this animation? Um, and, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll create a piece of animation and as game, the game develops, that number of frames will go down because they have to have the space for either more levels or Atari Vox support or whatever they're adding to it. And, uh, so Star Castle Arcade, the arcade, the, uh, castle explosion in that game is, is not procedural. That's all just animated. And the original animation for it was really, really smooth because I basically swiped it right off of the arcade game. But as the game developed, they had to keep chopping more and more frames out of it. And and it, it got so bad at some at one point, I just cringed whenever I saw it. Um, and then Thomas started working his magic that he does with saving ROM space and started adding frames back to it. So where it is now is a nice compromise between the two. But uh, but that happens on on a lot of games where you know if they'll give me the space I'll fill it with animation. And and did that happen on Ardvark where the number of frames of animation in Ardvark is astounding on the main character? Did you have a lot of room to work with that and you just said I'm just going to go for it because that seemed to be probably next to the dragon in Medieval Mayhem one of the most animated uh, sprites ever created for um, an Atari 26. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, it, the way that Aardvark worked was originally Oscar was trying to recreate the M network prototype. And so if you look at his early uh, builds and screenshots from that, 
it looks just like the M network prototype, which is rather crude looking. And as uh, as he progressed with it, and as Thomas got involved, they decided that they wanted to push it closer to the arcade game. So my first passes at the Aardvark looked like the Anteater from the arcade game, which looks terrible. It's this big orange blobby thing. And it has like two or three frames of animation, and that's about it. And so Oscar wanted me to improve it. And I, and I said, well, do you want me to just improve what's there, or do you want me to create something different? And both he and Thomas said, well, just, just create something new. And I asked how much space that was available for it, and Thomas said, well, it's, it's in its own bank, so just go for it. Just start animating. And so I was able to add in a lot of frames to that, and do things like having its head move as you're as you're moving the joystick back and forth. Because in, in the arcade game, the aardvark itself is static. You never see it move much once you're controlling it. And I thought it'd be m more interesting if it looked like you were actually controlling the aardvark instead. And so I got to do things like that and add in a few other little touches like it breathing and some things like that. Um, so we were able to do quite a lot with the aardvark. Oddly enough, though, the uh, the insects were in another bank, and that was full, so we couldn't really do anything else with that, and I wanted to add more insects to the game, so it's it's always a trade-off. Yeah, the, but the, the aardvark is, is astounding, the, the animation and, and number of frames. Yeah, especially when he's just, you know, just sitting there and you're playing the game, there's, you know, little movements in the, in the mouth or the trunk of the aardvark as he gets the gets the ants up it's it's really really great work uh, there's a question from the chat uh did nathan do the particle explosions in frenzy and that's uh, uh daryl spice jr's game oh no uh, uh that was all yeah, dave vasquez dave, dave also did all of the artwork in medieval mayhem so he did the the dragon and the knight in that game as well and he also worked on some stuff in uh one of the holiday carts, I think it was Grandma's Revenge on Stella's Stocking. And I think he's done some hacks as well. I haven't seen him around the forums much lately, but uh, he's, he's a phenomenal animator. Definitely. Um, I think that's about it, unless you had something else to, to add. Um, I de definitely want to thank you again for the amazing Retron 77 donation for the Stellathon. It's obviously raised a ton of cash. Um, so that, that's incredible. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for welcome. doing this. It's, it's been fun to watch. I've, I think that the interviews have been a lot of fun to, to watch and finally hear what Thomas sounds like. And uh, I, was, I was expecting a little bit more of a Texas drawl from Daryl, but I'm not disappointed either, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's been wonderful having all these, um, all these people on that I haven't talked to in person, but I've chatted with and and of course you have too over many years on the atari age forums and to and i've i've seen their pictures and and met some of them in person but it was really nice to talk with them on the on the the show finally and and yourself as well and so thank you so much for um for being part of this and being part of a huge part of the community too thank you so much well, you're very welcome. It's it's been my pleasure, and uh, looking forward to the Aardvark artwork reveal later this evening, sometime. Yeah, we're gonna do it right after this. I think it's a good uh, bookend to the, your uh, your call in. Okay, great. Well, I'll be watching uh, most of the rest of the evening, so hang in there, everybody, and drink lots of coffee, and hope you have fun. Fun. Well, thank you so much, and we will chat with you soon. All right. All right. Okay. Bye, Nathan. Bye. Bye.